This is Port Stories, brought to you by the Ports Past and Present Project. Sharing stories from five ports in Ireland and Wales. Dublin, Rosslare, Hollyhead, Fishguard and Pembroke Dock. Project funded by the European Regional Development Fund through the Ireland-Wales Cooperation Programme. Welcome to Digital Coasts, which is the fourth of the uh, Coastal Connections webinar series um, as part of the uh, Institute for Historical Research uh, Partnership Seminars. Um, this uh, series came about as an, a part of an initiative by uh, the Coastal History Network, Coastal Studies uh, community. And uh, the idea is to create a sort of diverse range of disciplinary global thematic perspectives on coasts. And I um, mean, so far we've had a, a webinar on coastal Brexit, we've had vanishing coasts and we've had coastal dystopias. Now we have digital coasts. So uh, my name is uh, James Louis Smith. Um, I, I will be your moderator, your chair for this session. Um, and we're joined by four respondent speakers. Uh, we're joined by Melanie Bassett from Portsmouth University in the UK. Sean Fragger from the University of Southern California, Sarah Knight from the University of York, and Jonathan Thayer from Queens College City University of New York, CUNY. Um, so basically, um, what I'm going to do is you'll see on the slide, I'm going to ask um, my colleagues to speak uh, for eight to 10 minutes in the order, you know, that the alphabetical surname order essentially. They're all going to offer a perspective on the topic. Um, and then what we're going to do is go straight into q and I have, um, we have a few questions we agreed on, um, just to give you a taste, you know, some of the questions we're interested in are, how can public history projects make best use of the power of digital collections? And at what point does the information become too much? Um, another question is what data sets are most relevant to coastal digital history? And what are important limitations or biases to these data sets? What is the contribution of digital mapping platforms to citizen science and participatory involvement in cultural heritage governance? And how do we support and sustain digital coastal studies initiatives? Um, just a few basic sort of um, ground rules. So the way we're running these uh, webinars is um, we'd ask um, everyone remains muted for the duration. Um, uh, speakers are pinned to the top so that they will appear, you know, first in the order and when speaking. Uh, in the Q&A section, which will follow the four talks that I mentioned, um, we will uh, ask that you ask your questions in the chat and uh, we will call them out. And for GDPR purposes, uh, we, I would ask that if any of the participants are calling out a question, please don't refer to the name of the person asking the question, just say, the question and then we'll address it either individually or as a group. Uh, we're aiming for 90 minutes, so we're aiming to go from 2 p.m. Uh, BST, British Summer Time, till 3.30. And uh, without further ado, I think uh, at this point it remains for me to just launch straight in. So I'm going to begin with our first speaker, uh, Melanie Bassett, who's a research fellow for Port Towns and Urban Cultures at the University of Portsmouth. PTUC have undertaken a number of digital public history projects, including the Sailor Town Walking App and Database, two Battle of Jutland casualty digital maps, Portsmouth and Gosport and UK wide, and a Royal Navy personnel Battle of Jutland casualty online database and exhibition. And all of this is available on the PTUC website, um, which uh, I can drop into the chat while Mel is talking. So without further ado, I'll, um, if you want to share your presentation, um, you're, I think you can just, just take over the screen and um, begin. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Hi, yes, yeah, so as um, James has introduced me, I'm Mel Bassett from uh, PTUC, Port Towns and Urban Cultures. Um, and I'm here to tell you about the, uh, the digital assets, the sort of suite of digital resources that we've um, created over um, our time as a research project. Um, the aim of Port Towns and Urban Cultures has been to look at the effects of maritime history on land. And what our particular focus has been to look at the urban environment and how uh, the coast and the, uh, the maritime aspect of 
people's livelihoods on in a poor town actually intersects and, and um, informs their life. Um, and we also, you know, we have a public facing website that people can access. So I've got the um, the email address on, on the screen now and the not the email address, the, uh, the website on the screen now. We also host uh, Isaac Land's uh, very important uh, coastal history blog. So um, check that out if you can. Um, so so um, as James mentioned, I'll be talking about the uh, the Sailor Town app, um, which has a database and a walking tour, and also about the two Battle of Jutland um, digital assets that we have. Um, our theme of urban culture sort of is explores the interplay really of the, um, of the spatial, and we particularly looked at the spatial turn and to see where sort of place and space have been a somewhat defining factor on how people in the past have navigated and understood their worlds. And so we've also tried to, uh, to juxtapose this with the present so we can actually uh, start to understand past relationships and the built environment we now inhabit. So, you know, you have this uh, past present connection going on. Um, and we really thought about the potential of the digital humanities for coastal history and, and what we were trying to do because it was a way of um, creating exciting and dynamic and interactive ways to communicate our research um, and to enable the public audiences to actually you know think about what it is that we're doing and how the, the topography um, sort of influences the you know the way people lived and the way people related to, to the coast and how it shaped their lives and so it was you know, a dynamic way to get our research out into the public domain. Uh, so the first one I'll go to is the uh, the Sailor Town database. So this is something that was created by my colleagues um, from a, a lot of it was um, spurred on by the data collection that uh, Dr Louise Moon actually undertook for her PhD research which, which looked at Sailor Town and um, she, she created a, a really big database of um, where sailors were living. She used the censuses and she also used things like uh, trade directories to map where pubs and uh, various um, facilities that sailors would have used in the town um, to sort of basically to, to start to think about the, the geospatial aspects of of what it means to be in the sailor town. And that was augmented by research from uh, our project lead, Brad Bevan, uh, Dr. Carl Bell, and uh, Dr. Bob James, who's here as well. And so it really used the idea of liminal spaces, looking between the, uh, the idea of the, uh, the coast, but also that in-between space between the coast and the waterfront and what how the waterfront is used by the people of this this particular instance the sailors um, and it was really sort of uh, inspired by Isaac Land's work um, and I just wanted to sort of quote something that Isaac wrote about um, a warning to check the approaches of uh, oceanic history and he warned that historians who cast their nets on the coast will catch considerable numbers of people whose lives and experiences have been missed by a scholar who trawls the oceans. So that's really the ethos of, of, of what we're trying to do is to, to look at those, uh, those lives and experiences on the coast that maritime history looking out to sea maybe doesn't quite get to, uh, to take advantage of. So um, the database actually contains uh, the particulars of about 3,500 sailors. We've mapped, because it's Portsmouth, we've mapped over uh, 1,500 public houses and lodging houses. There were a lot. Um, and these have all been geolocated. Um, census data was used, um, trade directories, local news reports on crime and supernatural occurrences are all stuff that comes up in the database that people can actually map and have a look and, and see the relationship of uh, the sailorhood and, and the way people were living, the way people you know, believed and operated in their lives uh, during these times. Um, and the concept really was to, to not just look at how sailors were um, you know, others, or it was, the sailor town was a place of otherness, it was to look at how the sailors are actually very prominent social actors and how they influenced the urban environment and actually interacted it with a lot more, um, you know, a lot more agency than they previously 
given credit for. So you'd be able to, we can map the boarding houses, look at who was running them. So a lot of the times you find landladies. And so you can look at, uh, you know, gender relationships and boarding houses, uh, look at missionary work and how that was um, influential in uh, sort of regulating the port town. Um, and I, it's not something I want to, I have got time to talk about now because it's a bit of a whirlwind tour, but I think, um, you know, in the discussion, if we could talk about potentialities for, for digital um, intervention, I think that's, you know, a good way of thinking about how this app can make interventions to how we think about methodology and digital frameworks in the future. Um, also, another part of um, what we did was create a couple of walking apps. So there's one of Old Portsmouth and one of uh, Portsea Sailor Town. So looking at two sort of different periods or 18th, 19th century and then 19th, 20th century Portsmouth and the, the ways that that interacted um, and things sort of changed over time. The, the geography of Sailor Town shifted. And so we can see those two timeframes quite clearly. Um, the walks are mapped by GPS so you can geolocate yourself, but also we found the advantage of uh, being in lockdown means that people can actually access what we're doing and explore Sailor Town virtually. So that's been a real boon for us as well. Um, I think really that this is something where, you know, the idea that the, the city is a palimpsest. So where different layers can be revealed and discover new narratives about the built environment and sort of the mundane and ordinary things we walk past every day can actually come alive. And what we try to do as well, as if you can see from the slide, is that we juxtapose the, um, the geolocation with the historical narrative, but also evidence of temporary material culture, contemporary material culture. So it sort of orientates it on a sort of physical um, conceptual and uh, material level. Um, so after for the next I wanted to discuss was the uh, the Battle of Jutland app. Um, these are two particular examples of co-production. We worked with the uh, Portsdown University of the Third Age on these two particular projects. Um, the Portsmouth and Gosport map was, um, was created with the University of the Third Age with um, our uh, Rob James, who's here today, and um, a PhD student called John Bolt. And that was a result of Heritage Lottery Fund money that they were able to, to roll out uh, this, this particular visualisation of the, uh, the casualties of the Battle of Jutland. And the, the second one, the All Navy Personnel uh, map, was um, part of the project that I worked on with Professor Brad Bevan, which was a HRC funded three uh, gateways to the First World War. And it sort of it mapped the six thousand, the over six thousand casualties that um, died at the Battle of Jutland uh, from the Royal Navy side uh, through an interactive map, an online database, and an online exhibition. Um, the Battle of Jutland, as many people will know, was probably the largest naval battle of the First World War, and it was prompted by looking at the First World War centenary um, commemorations and. It was a way that we found to bring out hidden histories by getting away from the usual tropes of, of remembrance and the popular focus on, uh, on trench warfare and to look in at maritime communities, the war at sea, and also the families that were left behind. And it, I think it also gets away from the idea of the, the squabbles about the, the blow for blow, what happened during the battle, and um, you know, who won, was it Britain or Germany? Um, so if we look at the uh, Portsmouth and Gosport map, you can see that the map is overlaid uh, with a historic map to illustrate the relationships between the Royal Navy and the distribution of the population. If we look at a little bit closer, we can also see how that spatial relationship between the coast and the maritime workforce um, can be explored. So this is um, Harry Phillips, who was a uh, Royal Marine Artillery, and we can explore those spatial and personal relationships with the coast at a time of war. And I think it's it's lovely for people to identify their personal histories, perhaps people that lived in the house, um, and also to, to appreciate what was happening or what happened in their local area and how it affects the local population. So in sort of a juxtaposition to that, I wanted to show you the next example, which is shows the relationship between maritime workers and the concept of home. 
So if we look at this, this is the, um, the, the whole Royal Navy casualty database that um, Brad and I and uh, the University of the Third Age and a few PhD students and um, other uh, BA students compiled. Um, casualties for the home stations of the ships in Portsmouth that are on the Naval War Memorial. You know, there's about 10,000 of them. Um, and it counts for all the, um, the casualties that were affected for the duration of the war. Um, over half those killed in Jutland, so that's about 3,000, were named on the Portsmouth Memorial. So it sort of skews the idea that all of the casualties came from Portsmouth. Um, but actually what we found when we looked at the, the distribution of the next of kin is that it was actually quite more of a, a wider repercussion of the of the battle. So we use sources such as the the uh, the war graves role for the, the Navy and the Royal Marines, Commonwealth, uh, Commonwealth war graves role, uh, pro-rate calendars, uh, BMD, um, and also collaborated, um, sort of corroborated with census records as well. Um, and sort of wanted to and examine British relationships with the sea and how the Battle of Jutland affected those lives. And so what we can actually see is this sort of map of loss and mourning, and it's been transformed from a, a very dry database to something which is, um, you know, brought to life in a sort of conceptual uh, rather than literal or approximate framework. So, you know, what we can actually see is that the, uh, the relationship to people in the coast can actually be a, a lot wider than um, you know, we, we think about, especially if we think about um, naval service and in terms of war. Um, we can also look at regional distribution and see that you know, although the war is associated with the coasts and the home ports, you know, there were significant impacts on, on urban and rural families in Britain. And you know, the fact that seafaring towns were disproportionately hit, we've been able to find that there were you know, over nearly 700 people from Portsmouth, um, 300 from the Plymouth area and uh, other regions with uh, merchant ports were also affected such as Glasgow, and London and Liverpool. Um, and what I think is particularly interesting is um, widening the possibility of the coast through this research. So, you know, we've gone from uh, sailor town and the liminal space of the sea, but we've also uh, can start to track those relationships to the coast digitally. Um, by looking um, also inland and those global connections of being and belonging. Um, and I think that's got real uh, research potential to think about how we conceptualise coasts um, and networks of, uh, you know, how people interacted and, and the maritime world in a, in a much uh, more holistic framework. So that's all I've got for, for now and I'll, uh, I'll pass over. Thanks very much, Mel. That was great. Um, moving on to our second speaker, Sean. So Sean Frager is a Mellon postdoctoral fellow with the, huma with the Humanities in a Digital World program and the History Department at the University of Southern California. He is a historian of the North American West and Pacific Ocean, using digital mapping, data visualization and text mining to research US territorial expansion. And um, he's recently um, created a digital history project, which I'll, I'll drop into the chat actually while uh, he's talking called, They Came on Waves of Ink, Pacific Northwest Maritime Trade at the Dawn of American Settlement, 1851 to 61. So uh, take it away, Sean, and you, you too should just be able to share your screen straight up if, if that's your preference. Terrific. Thank you so much, James. Uh, thank you to my fellow panelists, uh, all of you for being here this morning or this afternoon, depending uh, where in the world you are, um, and to everyone at the Institute for Historical Research for uh, a, a really fantastic and, and timely series of, of seminars about uh, these coastal environments. I'm joining you today from Brooklyn, New York, part of Lenape Hoking, uh, a native coastal territory that extends from here on Long Island south along the Atlantic coast, the Lenape have lived here since time immemorial and continue to do so today. 
As James said, I'm a historian. I'm a postdoc with the Humanities and a Digital World Program. Uh, my training is in a traditional history of department. Um, and uh, along the way, during my dissertation research, I found myself using digital tools to answer weird little research questions that I couldn't think to answer any other way. Um, and so in my current role, my current work with the Humanities and the Digital World Program, I'm thinking broadly about how to use digital tools and methods to support and advance humanistic interpretation. Um, and so today I'm going to be talking broadly about how digital tools and methods can be particularly useful to coastal historians. There are three parts of my argument today. I'm going to lay out the three big points before I jump into the screen share. The first is that port cities are rich sources for non-narrative data. And I'll talk more about what I mean by that. Second, it's easier than ever to work with this kind of data. Uh, I hope you've come away from our presentation, our panel today, inspired to, to try some of this out yourself. And third, that although it's easier than ever, although these tools are easy to access, although the data is easy to access, uh, you still have to use them carefully and thoughtfully um, in order to, to uh, make your use of them worthwhile. So uh, to demonstrate some of this and to, uh, to talk about what I mean, I'm gonna go ahead and, and start screen sharing here and get this slideshow rolling. Okay, so um, to my first point that, that port cities are, are sources of data. Um, I think all of us come to, the, to today's seminar uh, knowing how port cities can be really rich places for stories. Um, and I wanna shift our thinking and, and think about how, how port cities can also be really uh, rich places as, as repositories of data. We know how port cities channel the flows of people, of goods, of ideas, of diseases, that they serve as nodes for movement and exchange uh, of all of these things, that they, they connect local and global and regional networks. And all of these connections, all of this exchange and movement produces a lot of paperwork. It produces ledgers and logbooks and inventories and passenger lists. Um, so much of all of this that it, at points it can feel like we're drowning in information. These kinds of sources are often useful for specific targeted questions. Um, you know, I'm always going into Ancestry.com and looking at passenger lists to see when a particular person arrived in a particular port. Um, or I'm, I'm looking at, at customs records to see how much grain was exported from a particular customs district in a particular year, things like that. Uh, but part of my argument today is that this data can be useful to answer larger questions, uh, to look at aggregate trends, in part by um, using digital mapping and digital visualization tools. So here to my second point, that digital humanities uh, work, this kind of work with data is easier than ever. There is a surprisingly long history to the use of, of digital methods uh, generally for humanistic work and particularly for their use in maritime and coastal history. One of the first, one of the very first computational history projects, uh, Bernard and Lot Valens, Massachusetts Shipping, a Statistical Study, published in 1959, um, took a, a, a shipping ledger uh, in Massachusetts, a colonial shipping ledger, um, and hand coded thousands of punch cards. Uh, and with the support of, of people who had been specifically trained by IBM, ran all of these punch cards through tabulators and calculators uh, to produce statistical tables that could then help them answer questions. The amount of work that they put into this project is incredible. Things are very different today. Uh, where it took them these thousands of punch cards and these, these complicated mechanical computers, today with a digital camera, some time in the archives, a program like Excel or Google Sheets, um, and some time or some research support, you can really quickly transform an archival source into a data set uh, and then easily map or visualize the resulting data. But while these tools are easy to access, we still have to use them carefully. Computers are fast, um, but they aren't magic. And this kind of work, the digital humanities work, often brings into relief the kind of interpretive decisions that are always shaping our, our research, uh, but are often sort of below the surface. So to demonstrate these three points, I want to briefly take you through my own project. Uh, they came on Waves of Ink. Um, I'm going to do this quickly to leave time for discussion and questions. So this will be an overview, um, and I'm happy to discuss more in the, the Q&A. And I also invite you to visit the, the project website, seanfraga.com slash Waves of Ink. So this project investigates a single archival source. This is a ledger kept by U.S. Customs officials. 
1851, the United States created a new customs district covering Puget Sound uh, and the Pacific Northwest as part of the nation's expansion to the Pacific Coast. And this ledger covers that customs district first decade from 1851 to 1861. This is important because this is a period of enormous change in this region. Washington Territory is organized. Uh, the United States makes a series of treaties with indigenous nations. We see the start of sustained non-native settlement. Uh, there's a gold rush just north of the, the emerging U.S.-British North American border in Fraser River. And we see the start of the San Juan Islands boundary conflict, uh, a maritime border dispute between the United States and Britain that ends up lasting 12 or 15 years. It isn't resolved until after the Civil War. Uh, that's a very different story from what I'm, I'm here to talk about today. My point here is that while there are any number of stories uh, related to this place and to this period that, that are important, a ledger like this one isn't the first place that we would go to look to tell any of those. Where we have narrative sources like diaries or letters or newspapers um, representing um, how our historical actors um, understood themselves in relation to the world, the stories they told about themselves and the world they inhabited, a ledger like this recorded data. We tend to think of data as objective information. Uh, here's a list of everything that these customs officials recorded across this ledger. But I want to start by troubling that idea of, of data as, um, as objective, as, as, as something without a history. Joanna Drucker argues that data, as she puts it, does not exist independently, but is captured as the results of the parameters of the search. She refers to this as CAPTA, or information captured. Um, so I think it's useful to look at this list and instead of seeing data, see um, sort of a set of search queries. These were the things officials were interested in recording. And because this ledger is a document that was produced by US government employees uh, interested in specific information about the maritime traffic that they encountered, um, because of the choices they made, the ledger doesn't capture um, uh, uh, an equally large wealth of data. It doesn't capture information about the indigenous maritime networks that existed before American arrival and that continued operating during and after this period. Uh, it doesn't capture anything about the San Juan boundary conflict. Uh, I was surprised by this, but because both the United States and Britain considered the San Juan Islands to be domestic territory, um, it was not something that customs officials were interested in recording voyages to or from. And then finally, tabulating data like this, trying to take a messy world and fit it into these categories could often shear off uh, some of the rough edges of lived experience. There are occasional notes scattered throughout this ledger. Um, for example, there's a, a little note, three words, next to the entry for the ship Thracian, uh, which arrived in Olympia in, in 1851 or 52, and the note reads, seized, comma, ran away. And surely there's a larger story there about a ship that, that entered port that was seized by customs officials that was somehow taken back by its captain and crew and then, and then left again. Uh, but it's not in this particular ledger. So despite those structural limitations, um, and while we can keep those in mind, these data, the data contained in this ledger, still make it possible to examine um, this historical maritime traffic at an incredibly fine resolution by the day, by the individual voyage of vessel, rather than by the year uh, available in, in published sources. So I started to think of this, this ledger as a kind of 19th century spreadsheet. And to make use of this data or this CAPTA, uh, I worked with two research assistants to transform it into a 21st century spreadsheet. To give you a peek behind the curtain, this took about 60 hours of work spread across three months. Um, they were undergraduates. They did this in addition to their coursework as student workers. This was pre-pandemic. They worked on their own independently. We met maybe once or twice in person, but otherwise communicated over email. And uh, after those 60 hours, we ended up with 4,500 entries spanning from November of 1851 to April of 1861. I said a moment ago that we started to think of this as a 21st century spreadsheet. It's actually several spreadsheets because the customs officials used two or three different organizational schemes um, across the lifetime of this ledger. And what you see here is an archival copy. This is a spreadsheet that matches the ledger's organization uh, in, in all of its eccentricities and all of its changes as closely as possible. And from here, um, we're using, I'm using this archival copy 
to create other spreadsheets, other data sets um, that are specifically formatted for computational analysis. I'm going to come back to this point. One of the great things about digital research is that it's, it's non-destructive. You can have this archival transcription uh, and use the data in it to create something else um, that serves a different purpose. So this is the data. This is this is uh, this is the sort of the gross guts of the database. What can we do with this? This chart shows almost every trip captured by the ledger. It's plotted by vessel tonnage. So larger vessels uh, are, are are higher up the y-axis. Um, showing change over time from 1851 to 61, and color-coded by type of vessels. Uh, so steamships are in, in yellow, uh, full-rigged ships are, are there in red. Um, and this scatter plot helps to show how commercial currents flowing through Puget Sound shifted over time. You can really see how, how vessel size and trip frequency grows during this period, that spike in traffic after 1858, um, I don't think it'll surprise any of the historians here on the call. That's the Fraser River Gold Rush. What I found surprising about this data is that um, despite the increase in larger vessels visiting the customs district, average overall tonnage actually goes down during this decade. So for every large ship attracted by the gold rush, there are also countless smaller vessels um, that begin swarming through Puget Sound. And at first, I didn't really know what to do with this. I, I kind of thought it uh, uh, thought of it as a as a historical curiosity. Um, and in in presenting this project and in sharing it with colleagues, uh, someone with more experience in, in statistical analysis and scatter plots than I have suggested changing the y-axis. This never would have occurred to me. Um, in this scatter plot, the y-axis uh, again y points to the sky. The tonnage axis is on a regular scale. Each tick on the y-axis represents an additive increase of 200 tons. So 0, 200, 400, 600, and so on. But if we change this uh, from a regular scale to a log scale, we get a scatter plot that looks like this. This is exactly the same underlying data, but how we are representing it has changed. The y-axis is now on a log scale. Each tick represents a value 10 times larger than the previous one. So 0, 10, 100, 1,000, and so forth. And making this change, this representational change, uh, the gold rush now looks less like a spike in traffic, um, but 1858 is still important. What we see instead is that the, the post-gold rush traffic uh, resolves into an increase in the density of, of vessel traffic, particularly in involving smaller vessels, uh, schooners and sloops, those, those pink and teal vessels, small vessels, cheap, accessible, simple, simple to rig. The takeaway here is that the scatter plot is not the data. The scatter plot is one possible representation of the data. And this is, again, that idea that this digital work is not destructive. Something else I did with this, I, I used QGIS to map this data. Um, this global view shows us how the Pacific Northwest was connected to de destinations across the Pacific Ocean during this period, um, as well as a few key points in the Atlantic Ocean. But the cluster of points focused on the Pacific Northwest also makes evident how uh, it's relatively isolated during this period. What I like about this map is how it shows the wide extent of these links across this time period. Uh, even so, it does a poor job of communicating change over time or the relative importance of different, different destinations. All these points look exactly the same, regardless of whether it's one trip or a hundred trip. So to understand how traffic volumes changed over time, I made a series of maps um, trying to capture some of that energy in the scatter plot with points sized by the number of arrivals or departures. Those maps are on the project website uh, and they do a much better job at, at showing change over time. So I wanna wrap up by coming back to my first three points, uh, looking at, at all of these different representations of the data altogether. First, that port cities are sources of data. I've shown you just one customs ledger held by the US National Archives. There are hundreds of ledgers like this for each customs district in the United States. Uh, I mentioned Ancestry.com at the start of my talk. Ancestry has thousands upon thousands of passenger lists of people uh, entering or, or departing ports um, in the United States across the globe. And beyond these, these sources, beyond these particular archives, uh, more broadly, archives in port cities are full of non-narrative sources like this. Um, those ledgers, those logbooks, those, those port records, um, all of which can be productively 
uh, visualized and transformed. Second, again, this work is easier than ever. The tools that I used here, the tools that you see uh, represented here on the screen in front of you, a digital camera, Google Sheets, uh, a website called Data Wrapper, uh, and QGIS for the map. All of these are cheap or free or widely accessible. Um, and beyond that, there are excellent tutorials available online. Um, so you can come into this and, and learn by doing which is exactly what I've done with this project. And third, my final point, um, to use these tools with care. The best way to be careful with these tools is to talk to people uh, as the project is developing, to share early versions in the same way that we would with, uh, with analog, with non-digital uh, humanities work. Um, so I hope this gives a sense of, of some of the potential of, of digital tools for, for coastal history particularly. Uh, I'm going to stop here um and turn things back to to, to james uh, and the other panelists thanks very much sean that was great um and um moving on to our third speaker sarah knight uh who is the portal officer for pericles um an eu funded horizon 2020 research and innovation project pericles has developed an interactive online cultural heritage mapping platform the map your heritage portal it provides a platform for the crowdsourcing, public participation and engagement in cultural heritage data collection um, for the project, creating new information relating to the location description and the human values associated with maritime and coastal cultural heritage across eight case regions in Europe. And Sarah is responsible for designing and delivering the technical aspects of the portal, as well as facilitating its use across the case regions. And I'll drop in those links while Sarah is talking for you to the portal and to the website. Um, but I'll leave it up to Sarah to share her screen and to, uh, to take it away. Nice one. Thanks, James. Um, and thanks for inviting me to be on this wonderful panel. It's great. Um, I've also been chased around the kitchen by the sun, which has just emerged in England for the first time this year. So um, excuse me if I shuffle around, you're not blinded by my, my background here. Um, okay, let me grab my slides. Um, okay, so yep, as, as James said, um, I'm uh, Sarah Knight. I work at the University of York um, in UK and I am a researcher in the department and uh, part of my job is to be the portal officer for the Pericles project. Um, so this is what I'll be talking about today. As part of the Pericles project, we made an online mapping platform. So I'm going to focus on that part of, of Pericles today. So I'm going to talk about Pericles, um, what we do, um, why in the, in the world we should even need a cultural heritage portal in the first place, um, what our platform does, what we intend for it to do um, and how it can be used and then finish off with just some of my own thoughts about some of the the barriers and the interesting kind of side tangents we've gone off um, in in making this platform and using it with, with stakeholders in Europe. So Pericles, um, it's an EU funded um, research and innovation project. We're in our final six months um, which is terrifying. <laughs> Don't know where that's gone. Um, so we're a, a multi-country, uh, multi-partner uh, project and we use interdisciplinary approaches um, to better understand the tangible and the intangible cultural heritage across our eight case regions across Europe. So there's a lot of us in this project <laughs> and um, basically the heart of what we do is um, kind of co-design, co-development. Um, it's at the heart of everything that we do to engage with our stakeholders across the different case regions. So alongside that as well, we also have developed a range of tools. I think we've got a tools handbook coming out shortly, um, which will be on our website. Um, one of these tools is the, uh, the portal that I'm going to be focusing on today. So just a, a, a little background. Why have we done this? Why do we need this? Well, um, there's growing recognition um, of the importance of accounting for human environment relationships um, for successful um, governance in coastal and maritime regions. Um, and despite this recognition, um, cultural values and intangible heritage um, are still not present in current policy. Um, and just that as well, despite uh, coastal and maritime cultural heritage being affected by many other policy areas. So lots of work shows um, that listening to and including stakeholders and community knowledge and values um, in policy leads to improved decision making, leads to um, enhancement of trust, um, 
leads to the improvement of reputation of policy and also increased compliance. So by providing opportunities and mechanisms for communities to participate in initiatives that influence decision making, um, policy becomes more democratised. Um, and the outcomes are much more likely to be successful and sustainable. So in the EU, there's lots of uh, frameworks and uh, platforms that um, integrate policies across all the countries um, for the sustainable development of all sea-based and coastal activities. Um, and underpinning these, these processes, these policy-making processes and these decisions um, is good quality data and, and evidence. Um, and moreover, and um, placing cultural heritage in a spatial context um, allows us to provide new insights. So it allows us to vary scales, allows us to um, place cultural heritage in the context of other um, important phenomena, allows us to bring in new data, um, it identifies clusters and hotspots of activities and risks, allows us to observe geopolitical um, influences and explore space and place um, in a new representational and analytical way. So with all that in mind, we decided to embark on making a, a platform, an online web mapping platform um, for all of our case regions across Europe. So these were the aims of our portal um, to basically to better understand cultural heritage, to really find out where it is um, situated in a maritime and coastal um, place. To give the opportunity for citizens and communities across Europe to engage and add um, to this mapping exercise. Um, to a, a large part of what Pericles does is work with stakeholders in different regions. So um, this, this portal is really aimed as a as a engagement and facilitation tool for stakeholders across within and across the case regions. And also to provide an opportunity for analysis um, in a spatial setting. So we have these big, these grand aims for the portal. And whilst doing it, the geographer in me, the GIS person that will always be inside of me, um, came up with all these other questions as well whilst doing this. Um, and it was interesting, you know, from our perspective, what we think should be on a map. Um, and working with our different stakeholders who are, who are incredibly varied from kind of um, heritage practitioners, natural heritage practitioners to fisher people, tourism, um, industries, um, you know, all, all manner of stakeholders within kind of coastal and maritime policy and governance. Um, you know, what, what don't they like to see on a map? If they're going to come and engage on a map and share their, their heritage and their knowledge and content, um, what, you know, what makes them tick? What turns them off? Um, how do stakeholders use it? And how do different stakeholders use it? Um, you know, what works and what, what doesn't in this, in this process? Um, so all of, all of that, I'll share some of my our thoughts on this um, later on. Um, so conceptually, um, a project prior to Pericles, um, based with some colleagues up at Sands in the Outer Hebrides, in, um, sorry, in Scotland, um, made this Mapping the Sea map. So again, it's got this nice aesthetic um, interface and uh, the idea is, is that people can come to the map and upload their content regarding coastal and maritime cultural heritage um, on the island of Barra in the Outer Hebrides in, in Scotland. So that was really the kind of conceptualization for this kind of um, project. And from there um, blossomed our um, European wide um, portal. So this is where you, you can find it. This is what the homepage looks like. So the, it's divided into the eight case regions that we work in for, for the time being, it's situated in that way. Um, and it, this portal really was designed to enable um, a real kind of integration, a real way for people to explore what already exists there, to um, add to it, and also to share and um, kind of communicate with different users within it as well. So um, if I'll show you some of the some of the features of it. So this is going into one of the case regions is Denmark. Um, the portal's available in the eight in eight languages. So I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, I'm wiggling it around here in the top right. Um, that's where um, you can change the language. So that all the languages represent our, our case regions. Um, that was no mean feat, <laughs> as you could imagine. Um, and so on here down the right, you can see the different uh, tools and some of the functionality of, of the portal. So um, you can add your own data. Um, you can then create trails from this, so you can make trails from existing data or um, your own uh, new content that you add. Um, the key here is just a kind of um, 
structure of the data that's in there. So under each of these headings, there's lots of different types, lots of different categories of data. So when you upload data, um, you can you categorize it um, in that way. That has has kind of consequences for metadata and and, and so forth. Um, and there's filtering tools to kind of turn turn data on and off and a bookmarking um, tools to be able to map, make maps and to, to print that way. So really the, the platform here is has kind of dual function really from, from our perspective. Um, one as a, a, a data gathering platform um, and to kind of enable users to interrogate and add data, but kind of more broadly, it can be used as a, as a platform to facilitate um, discussions and decision making. So it's a participatory tool um, that can be used by different stakeholders, different policymakers, different communities um, to visualize data, to incorporate data from other places to um, for their uses. So within this, there's there's user added data, which I think you see here, and then also within the um, key on the right, um, we've embedded lots of existing, sec we, we call them official data, but existing layers. So we've, we've moved in things, for example, from um, eModnet, which is the European um, marine um, data portal. So with web feature services, we've just automatically moved data in here. So you can see, for example, the European, um, layer of lighthouses, for example, um, if that's where you want to go. Um, and then also we've got lots of national uh, geo databases um, fed into this as well. So there's really rich data. So you, it's the really nice um, marriage of existing kind of national international data sets alongside user added um, data, which has caused um, some issues in its own right. <laughs> okay, so I, from our point of view um, and how how it's changed throughout the um the project obviously we, we had we had a work program and it changed a lot with covid um lots of stuff has gone online lots of stuff's been cancelled etc but but you know i think i think melanie said it it's opened up opportunities that we didn't um foresee as well so we've within the project ourselves um we've um held uh, mapping workshops um the portal's used as a kind of a crowdsourcing um interface um, there's also been sessions run with schools um, and really the portal can be used by it's meant to be used by anybody so uh, we've got lots of community groups and citizens that, that use it um, we've got for example there's lots in Northern Ireland lots of community heritage groups which are liking to use the portal to digitize their archives and to have a, a map that's already been made for them to to, to visualize all that um, we've got a group of users who use it more in an analytical sense, um, so very much interested in downloading the data and using it um, for to answer questions or to inform decision making. And then thirdly, there's a more kind of, I hate the word exploitative, but I think it's it's the one that's used, so um, industries that can be used to um, exploit um, heritage assets that are captured in there and use it, for example, for tourism. So there's a big tourism theme to um, Pericles' work, um, and that's where the trails fits in nicely. And um, a, a colleague in who might even be here today um, has been using uh, the portal and um, the platform Easy Travel to um, for storytelling and trail making um, for tourism industries. Um, so there's many different, um, I guess, work areas, um, for want of a better phrase, that can, that can use the portal. So this has been picked up by the European Marine Planning Space, Marine Spatial Planning Platform. Um, but it caught, so it's, it's it can, so obviously marine spatial planning is one huge area where um, participatory mapping and crowdsourcing data can really um, input. Also, just in terms of um, heritage conservation and governance, um, identifying risks. Um, so a lot of work we look at is um, risks from climate change, um, risks from um, other development, um, coastal erosion, etc. cetera. Um, planning and development um, processes and, and tourism, as I've mentioned. So um, it's just a case study from the portal is um, one of our case regions is the island has got the region. It's a huge, all of our case regions are, are coastal regions, some are multi-country, 
This one focuses on Belfast, um, west coast of Scotland and Galway Bay. Um, and the, I, the priorities for this region were to really to have a central place to collect cultural heritage locations and data to really fill in the gaps really. So there's designated heritage places and assets, but there's lots um, of important coastal maritime and cultural heritage um, assets, tangible and intangible, which um, don't aren't designated and falling between the cracks. So it's really to, to create a larger data set for this. Um, to identify risks, um, really definitely platforms like this are great to capture um, intangible heritage, those kind of richer things that are that aren't quantified and are really absent in um, policy and decision making processes at higher levels um, and really um, to do with legacy as well so um, lots of um, heritage ar archives aren't digital um, are held by um, kind of older communities um, or people that are moving away from the region so they really want they really saw this um, to be used as a kind of a legacy platform for them so in all of our case regions, the, the approach to using the portal is completely led um, from a participatory point of view. So whoever, whoever our stakeholders are, however they want to use the portal and what they want to see in it um, is led by our community. So, for example, we work a lot with museums, um, heritage community groups um, and, and local governments. So there's a lot of um, participatory work in there and the, all the efforts are there to really have uptake of the portal um, beyond Pericles. Um, so just zoning in here, this is Belfast in Northern Ireland. Um, this is just some points about the industrial heritage in, in Belfast. Um, users being busy uploading stuff here. Um, and they've turned some points into different trails. So I think there's, there's about 10 trails or so forth in this case region, um, which, can then, which are then being used by uh, different tourism groups and heritage groups um, in the area as well. So as, this is just my brain um, dump onto here, things that I just thought came up while we were doing this. Um, one, one huge thing for us was um, the aspect of digital literacy in terms of how comfortable people feel with using online technology anyway, and also um, the spatial digital literacy. So we've had people who um, aren't comfortable with maps, just in generally, some people aren't orientated to a spatial way of working, which, you know, that's just who we are. Um, and there, is, there are um, people who just um, don't, aren't comfortable with, with the digital um, tools. Lots of, this came up particularly in our Estonian um, case region where many of the stakeholders are um, um, older communities on the small islands there, um, that are really rich in, in, in heritage and their, their aim was to, um, kind of make trails and digitize um, their um, heritage to exploit it for tourism purposes. Um, but as, as, a, as a community, um, they have much lower digital literacy than say um, the school kids of in, in, in our community in Greece. Um, so they, they, we had real, um, um, what's the word, hindrance of kind of barriers to, to uptake of, of the platform. Here, which was interesting and particularly we found lots of heritage kind of uh, knowledge sits with older populations um, so this is a real um, sticking point here for how you can um, how you don't isolate um, certain populations when trying to to capture this um, in terms of mapping expectation I'm just trying to remind myself what I meant by mapping tools this was around um, what people expect when they come to a map. So um, we've done lots of usability testing on the portal, um, initially with university students who are studying um, history or um, heritage. And um, they, they have really specific expectations, uh, you know, generations that's been brought up with Google Maps, for example. So if it looks different to Google or it works in a different way to Google Maps, um, they question it and think something is wrong or they don't trust it or um, something needs changing. Um, so we made the, the portal as a, a bespoke software, it's built on open source um, software, so it's bespoke to the project. Um, and it's, that's been an interesting um, process in figuring out what people expect and if they don't see what they expect then they don't trust it which limits their, their use so um that's that's which is a process in itself that's that's a really interesting way to go i don't even know I don't, we can talk about this in the in the q a um 
And then in terms of data expectations, what people expect to see on the map. So what a policymaker wants to see on their map is very different to what a school kid wants to see on their map. So we've tried to make this platform, you know, open to um, essentially everybody. <laughs> um, but uh, what people want is different. So we have all these secondary layers in, you know, um, outliers of um, protected areas. Um, I think what else is in there all, all kinds of if, official data sets that are in there and some people come to the map and are very confused by by those layers and don't want to see that and again it stops them using it or stops them trusting what's what's there so again it's it's difficult to make um a map for, for everybody and i think going forward we'd probably want to assess actually you know who are your users and do you have different views for different types of users for example i don't know if anybody has any experience in that but i'd really like to discuss that with anybody um in terms of engaging people with it community engagement we found um it's much easier to um engage with people who enjoy using online maps <laughs> they open up a gateway of people to, to to facilitate people to use it so working with kind of community leaders community gatekeepers or the technical people within communities is a really efficient way to populate the map um and in terms of data quality which is a problem with any citizen science kind of public mapping volunteering uh, geographical information project is the quality of the data so we've got data in the portal which adheres to kind of you know, global EU level um, specifications like the Inspire um, directive, which requires specific data, metadata, etc. Um, alongside, you know, a point that somebody might have just uploaded from their mobile phone with a photo and just plopped it somewhere. Um, so in terms of kind of data consistency and data quality, we have to look at um, moderation and um, you know, spatial consistency and quality of, of content as well. So it's, it's similar for any citizen science project, but that's something that we, we are battling with at the moment. And that, that, that was just my top list. Summary, this is what the portal does. Um, the key features really are the fact that it's multilingual, it's interactive, um, and it's meant for sharing, and that the dual purpose that it can collect data, but it's also a tool for um, decision making and, and discussion. These are the guys that made it. <laughs> uh, thank you to these ones. Well, that's me, thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. I'm in awe of localizing something in eight languages. That sounds, as I, as, as I can imagine from what you said, that sounds uh, like a lot, a lot. I'd like work. to say, it wasn't, it wasn't me that, that translated it all. I would love to be uh, fluent in eight languages. <laughs> Not me. <But> yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, and um, our last speaker today is uh, Jonathan Thayer, who is Assistant Professor at the Graduate School of Library and Information Studies, Queen's College, City University of New York, where he teaches courses in archival studies and public history and conducts research on topics related to archival studies pedagogy. He's the author of a monograph in progress on United States sailor towns and co-editor um, of Maritime Masculinities in a Modernizing World, 1815 to 1940. So um, take it away, Jonathan, and if you also would like to share your screen, you're very welcome to do so. Okay, thanks, James. Um, let me present here. All right, it's good to go last because I, now I can adjust my presentation since uh, there's so many intersections and I think I, I can focus on a few things here, but I titled my presentation um, Towards a Digital Coastal History of New York City but maybe I should have titled it Towards a Pericles of New York City. That might be a better title, having uh, heard Sarah's talk. Um, so I, I sort of straddle uh, academia and practitioner as an archivist um, and uh, as a, uh, an assistant professor and uh, with a PhD in history and a focus, as James mentioned, in um, US sailor towns. Uh, so, um, really what I want to speak about today is our efforts through a National Park Service Maritime Heritage Grant uh, and a co-convener of a series of workshops and events involving digital heritage at sites of public maritime history in New York. And, um, and I want to ask some, some questions and maybe point some folks to resources for how, how maybe to do this at a, at a local or, I mean, Heracles at the at a much larger level. Um, 
so in order to work towards digital coasts, uh, and I'm coming from this from a coastal history perspective, uh, you know, I'm asking myself, what would that require? And from academia, I would say it requires resources. And I draw on a community archives model of shared authority and participatory stewardship of heritage. And I can return to those concepts a bit later. Um, it also requires from academia, open access to source material, data sets, and scholarship. Um, it requires investment in libraries, archives, and museums, um, which is a, a, something that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, and, and finally, a focus on digitization as an ongoing process um, rather than a single act. Um, and digital history initiatives that embrace public hosts outside of academia. So my real entry point into this work is through the Siemens Church Institute of New York and New Jersey. Uh, I've been their archivist for over a decade and now very much on a part-time basis since I have my appointment at Queens College, um, but still uh, engaged with them. And that's primarily with, uh, with whom I've been working on the programs I'll describe. Um, so this is the uh, floating church. Uh, this is the sort of origins of the Siemens church in the 1840s. They eventually upgraded, as you can see, to this 13 story, 520 dormitory building in lower Manhattan um, in New York. Uh, this was opened in 1913. Um, this is a view, you can see the building down here looking out on New York Harbor, just to give you some perspective. Um, they sort of implanted themselves or embedded themselves within uh, Manhattan's sailor town. And finally, this is uh, Port Newark, as port traffic moved out of Manhattan to northern New Jersey, uh, Siemens Church followed and they have a welcome center here. And I'm gonna jump around a little bit with my screen. Um, but one of my primary projects over the past decade has been the Siemens Church Institute archives, which I hope you can see um, uh, on your screen there. But this is a, a digital archives project that has about 12,000 digital objects, including photographs and scrapbooks and bound volumes, um, and also census data and oral histories related to, um, sorry, right, uh, related to New York specifically. So uh, the oral histories are actually national. Those are uh, focusing on merchant uh, seamen particularly. So these are civilians who work on uh, with cargo and not military folks. So this has been a work in progress. And so the next step in um, this process was, you know, the decision to kind of bring the experience and, you know, whatever expertise I gained from working on that project out into Maritime New York and starting with probably the most prominent um, institution or organization uh, related to Maritime New York at this point is South Street Seaport Museum, uh, which is one of the last remaining areas of preserved Maritime New York uh, in Lower Manhattan. Uh, but they faced challenges over the years, as, as is documented in, um, oh, I'm blanking on the name of the book, but uh, over the years since the 60s, they've uh, they faced many challenges, including, uh, you know, 9-11, moving tourism out of lower Manhattan, uh, uh, Superstorm Stan Sandy flooding their, their buildings and, and uh, basically shutting them down. And now they're facing threats from, as you can see by this photograph, ec economic development. So there's developers who are very anxious to get their hands on this real estate. Likewise, other marginal or more marginal um, maritime heritage organizations in New York face challenges. This is the uh, Lehigh Valley 79 barge, railroad barge, which has been converted to a museum. It's called the Waterfront Museum. It's in Red Hook, Brooklyn, um, which is a historically maritime neighborhood uh, of Brooklyn. A uh, man named David Sharps converted this into a museum and actually his residence, he raised his two daughters uh, on, this, on this barge. He's lived on it for about 30 years. 
this is the Mary, Mary Whalen. Um, it's an oil tanker that's been converted again into a cultural space and uh, sort of a community center. Um, and uh, again, wonderful person, Carolina Salguero, uh, kind of took up this project and created this space for uh, engaging communities with the waterfront in New York, because often, um, or almost always, the waterfront becomes, or the maritime history aspect of the waterfront in New York is uh, forgotten. Um, we're, we're looking towards progressing economically, as we saw with the South Street Seaport Museum um, and uh, the, the maritime past, which has moved, you know, that, that port traffic moving to New Jersey, that maritime past is really uh, threatened. Um, so, so what we set out to do was uh, form some sort of consortium on a, on a you know, smaller, small level. Um, and once we had our, our group together in terms of um, a list of, of organizations or communities or individuals who are invested in New York maritime heritage, we launched a set of programming that was focused on mobile digitization. And so what you're looking at is one of the outbuildings of the South Street Seaport Museum. And I am demonstrating a mobile digitization kit. And that's actually just a simple camera tripod that's set up in inverted, you know, it's inverted so, so as to shoot downwards um, towards objects. And what it's, what it's set up on is actually a uh, suitcase. So you can pack that up and roll it with you. And actually before uh, the pandemic hit, our next stop was going to be Staten Island. We're going to bring the equipment on the ferry and get off in Staten Island and go to the Lighthouse Museum and do another event just to show how portable this, this stuff is. And uh, that was obviously interrupted, but we hope to do it soon. Uh, this is from inside the, the barge the waterfront museum that I showed the photo of earlier, as you can see, it's really cozy and nice. Um, we had a, what we call a floating conference, and this brought together a number of stakeholders. Um, you can see the list here uh, to talk about their sort of pockets of New York maritime heritage and uh, interest in participating in some sort of digital consortium. And, um, I focused on teaching sort of 101 digitization. Uh, as James mentioned, I'm a professor of archival studies, so I teach digi digitization. Uh, but, you know, so the, this was sort of a gathering of folks who were interested in getting their stuff up online uh, through this process of digitization. And you can see it's a real mix of, you know, academia, nonprofits, uh, museums, historic vessels. Um, the New York City Economic Development Corporation, so municipal organizations. Um, uh, so it's, it was a real, uh, you know, inspiring event that Chris sort of set off this consortium idea that's still very much a work in progress. So what, I think with the remaining, remainder of my time, I want to talk about uh, project management. And I think this is really important in, in terms of, you know, creating these, these really exciting and engaging digital humanities projects or digital history projects um, that uh, are really high risk uh, from an archivist's perspective or a digital scholarship librarian's perspective. And so, like I said, digitization as an ongoing process as opposed to a one-off act of scanning and or, or a two-part act where it's a scan and then a publication um, or a visualization. Uh, these are just some of the steps um, involved in de decision-making related to how you're going to go about digitizing materials. So uh, one aspect that I really want to hone in on is digital preservation. And so this is there's really, so, so this is my approach to teaching digital preservation. It's very simple. I'm not, this isn't really my specialty at all, but there's really two options. One is this option, which was developed by NASA and uh, is, is quite complicated, as you can see. Um, and most organizations don't have the resources to um, go from the submission to the disposition or the, uh, the SIP to the DIP, as we call it in, in archives land. And then everything that goes on in between here requires staffing and capacity and resources and money ultimately. Uh, but 
the basic idea is this front end back end concept. So if you look at you know, the front end of a, of a website like the digital archives, this requires preservation. Um, this, uh, you know, Omeka is the content management uh, system that we use for this and they upgrade almost once a year at least. Uh, and you need to keep up or else your site will degrade, it'll start to look dated or, you know, eventually it's going to break. And that actually happened to us last year and we had to migrate um, to a, a new version that was quite disruptive. Um, so that's the front end. Uh, the back end is all of your great data sets um, and files. And so there are best practices for file formats for different types of resources, of course. Um, and those are really, really important. And, and it gets down to the minutia of file naming. Um, file naming, I always say, is the first step in digital preservation. Uh, so that you, you know, you don't wind up with this overload of data or digital resources that you can't make sense of or use because either the file has corrupted over time or de degraded um, or because you don't know what it is because you have 12,000 files that haven't been named properly. Um, so the front end, back end, I prefer over NASA's. Um, that's just what we're <laughs> capable of as, as a nonprofit um, Siemens Search Institute. But luckily there are resources for us uh, that are publicly available and I'll end on this note. Um, the Federal Agency's Digital Guidelines Initiative has best practices for a bunch of different file formats and then you can kind of choose, you know, how how high quality do you want to do you want to go? Do you want to just be good enough, or do you want to be, you know, as good as good as possible? Um, Culture and Transit was a great project that, uh, you know, like they said, they were digitizing, democratizing metropolitan New York's cultural heritage. Um, sort of the inspiration for going out with this mobile digitization equipment, bringing it to the sites and the people who have this stuff and want to get it up on um, the internet and share it. And one of my favorite ones is Archivist in a Backpack, which was developed by the University of North Carolina. And they too have, um, so Culture and Transit has this great spreadsheet with a bunch of equipment and what they prefer and notes and where to buy it and how much it costs. And uh, this, all this equipment fits in a backpack. That's the concept, it really does. And you can record oral histories, you can, you can scan uh, photographs, documents, et cetera. Um, all out of, out, out of your backpack. And then finally, you know, where, do you, where, do, where to host this stuff? Well, there's, there's really encouraging developments and options to host um, your content once you get it digitized, including Urban Archive. So this is, our, this is our site on Urban Archive. All of our photographs have been geolocated and you can walk around with your cell phone through lower Manhattan and see, you know, what existed there before, um, you know, what, before. <laughs> so to conclude, um, there's hope for, you know, in digital history, as long as we invest in collaboration, consortium, consortium and inclusivity of our publics and our diverse expertise and resources. And that gets back to the community archives theory. And there's great uh, theorists writing about this. Michelle Caswell um, is, is at the forefront in the U.S., uh, but this is really archival study stuff. Um, and it's really about participatory stewardship and shared expertise, shared resources. Challenges to that are money and capacity, priorities of these institutions in terms of participating. Um, silos are always an issue and skepticism towards academia or people who want to get your stuff essentially. Um, so I'll end on that note. And here's my contact info. Um, my Twitter, I tweet about uh, other things, but you can follow me if you want. Thanks. Thanks very much to all of our speakers. Um, that was, I think, a really good range, like breadth of different, firstly, different roles within, broadly speaking, what could be constituted a digital coast, and also the different sort of methods that need to be deployed in order to do that work, and also a lot of different types of technologies. So um, we've got 10 minutes for questions now. So what I'm going to do, because we have these four questions that were posed by the, the speakers, is I'm going to start by asking a question, which actually leads on from what Jonathan was just saying. So I think it's an appropriate place to start. And I'll ask anyone who's got a question from the audience uh, if they could uh, pose their question in the chat. 
and um, I will then uh, um, pose one of your questions following this one. So this this first one's an open question, and it basically leads on a bit from the sort of open question from um, Jonathan's talk about how do we support, support and sustain digital coastal studies initiatives? I mean, I have many of the same issues with the um, we are uh, ports past and present. The project I work on is an Omeka based, you know, website as well. Um, you know, constantly trying to keep up to date, but also ensuring that your data is, you know, interoperable and is going to live beyond your project life cycle. I imagine Sarah, I imagine Pericles is winding up its data management plan and, ha and having a bit of a data panic as these as long term projects always do. So I guess my question to all of you is, yeah, um, moving and and Jonathan, if you have more to add, like how how can we try and make sure that these projects are sustained and supported long term? Yeah, I can say something. Um, yeah, yeah. It's like it's like you glimpsed my inbox. <laughs> um, yeah, it's um, th there's a definite. We have a definite problem with them. Um, you know, you get we get funded for for three years or so, and then you know everyone's unemployed afterwards, um, and everything gets kind of you know s stored on a server somewhere. So um, a, a big piece, a really important part of work that we were doing was to through kind of participation of organisations that um, will exist after we are long gone, um, museums, governments, community groups, etc., was to really kind of embed our work with them so that they can uptake things afterwards. So making, for example, making data um, exportable out of what we're doing so that they can take it on. Um, op using open source software so that it's available for um anybody everybody wants to use it um yeah and aligning you know, making sure that actually what we're doing is going to be useful for people afterwards so yeah that's what I'd say. if i could just add very briefly i'd say work with librarians and work with archivists as much as possible and there's more and more dh librarians or digital scholarship librarians at least in the u.s that's what they're calling them um, but work with archivists, they're your friends, <laughs> and they have, sh again, sharing expertise is, is what it's all about, I think. I'll come in from the perspective of uh, an individual researcher working on a, a small-scale project. Um, looking back across this, I think there are, are, are two points where it's particularly important to ask yourself these questions. The first is, uh, at the start of things, uh, before you have figured out how to format the data, before you've figured out what file formats you're using, um, think about longevity. Um, and I want to share in the chat a link to something from the University of Victoria, uh, a really simple questionnaire uh, designed to sort of prompt you to think about all of the different ways a digital project might be um, uh, sustainable or accessible over the long term. And second, at the end of things, um, if you can, publish your data sets. If you're working with data that, that isn't protected or under copyright or um, isn't tied to um uh 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 you know if it's if it's if if everyone involved has agreed uh get it out there and there are are any number of ways to do this at the at the most informal you can link to it on dropbox or on github or on google drive um you can put it up on your your own institutional repository if that's something they offer um or by formally publishing in something like the journal of open humanities data um, and I think publication is important you want to because you want to make it so that that people don't have to ask you for these. Um, it really lowers the barriers if this stuff is is just out there with uh, some context and some explanation so that other people can can find it and use it in in their own research, their own teaching. Yeah, I think from our point of view as well, um, we've tried to uh, have legacy by making different permutations and additions to the digital resources. So one of the things that we did was actually work uh, with um, a, a sort of a cultural arts company um, sort of on a, um, an arts council bid and then it sort of augmented the website and they actually then did uh, cultural uh, 
recreations and reimaginings of some of the sailor town walks so we've actually it breathes life into the project and um sort of recasts it in a different way so one of the things that that we look at as a project which has been recognized in our university as being something which um you know has that referable impact to the research excellence framework and also knowledge exchange and and benefits in for our teaching and our research-led teaching as well as actually to look at how we can extend that and and bring out some of the possibilities. We have a, a database which has a, a range of data which we can interpret in lots of different ways and we can use in lots of different ways to um, you know, bring out these histories and bring the, the history to life. So we're always constantly looking for new opportunities to extend that research and to augment what we've done to make it better, to add layers, to add um, different interpretations. So. I think that's another way of uh, creating legacy is just, um, you know, keep thinking of ways that it can be added to and augmented if, if you've got the capacity, if it's not a short term project to, to think of other ways to fund it and to keep it going. I guess another thing to add to that in the European context, of course, is that, um, I mean, a lot most countries EU countries or you know have a national aggregator right or a um, core trust repository for us in Ireland it's the digital repository of Ireland um, we at UCC my institution have just joined that and we're going to use that as a way of archiving a lot of our material and then of course there's Europeana and all these institutions ag so there as well as you know yeah like GitHub Zenodo, putting, creating an archive, a repository of your own or on a, you know, institutional repository, there's that chance to aggregate much wider as well and think creatively about something I, that's close to my heart, which is data archiving as a form of dissemination and presentation. So, you know, making exhibits out of the data that you've archived and there's a little, and I think that works particularly well with, with Blue Humanities. Okay, so we had an interesting question in the comments um, about tricky data. So, you know, uh, the, the question asked about cultural data, coastal cultural data in the UK being old scanned photographs with little metadata and audio format, only part of which may be relevant. And um, the, the, the question poser would be interested in hearing how the speakers have addressed this tricky type of data and incorporated into their databases. I think I think another dimension of that as well as like tricky as in tricky as in lacking in provenance is at, as something Sarah pointed out, which is that community data often, you know, could say a lot of community blogs and, you know, local institutions have blogs. A lot of the standards of uh, seeking permission for images or, you know, uh, seeking it is not the same as what an academic uh, would would want of something. So um, is, it'd be interesting to hear any challenges encountered by any of you in that respect of, yeah, reconciling different types of data standards. Yeah, I could say something about about this. Um, we, we've we kept, I think, the, the require, I'm not sure what the right word is, the, the requirements for upload into our uh, portal low. <laughs> so it's it kind of ex accepts a lot of a lot of types of things um and the metadata produced is um kind of linked back to the uploader and whatever they choose to put on the on the card um and then it has a creative commons license so everything is open so if you agree to upload onto the portal it's it's um one of the Creative Commons license, so it's reproducible, but it's you have to attribute, um, like YouTube. Um, so it's out there. So we're try not trying to um, make it fit. Basically, we're trying to make a system that fits what we get. I think that that helps. <laughs> That's what we did. Yeah, uh, I'll weigh in also. Um, I think it's it's maybe useful to to think about this question um, of. Of these scandal photographs with little metadata, um, which I also encounter in, in um, archives and, and maritime museums in the United States. Um, from the perspective of someone building a database, take what you can. Any metadata is better than none. Uh, you want to get as much information as you can. You never know how uh, a particular data point will be useful to a future researcher. From the other side of it, as somebody who's using these things um, and preparing them for 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 publication or um, uh, preparing them for an audience, I think with 
with this question and, and more broadly with these digital projects, our goal should always be to present these data as partial, as situated, and as incomplete. Um, and I'm drawing again on Joanna Drucker here, thinking about uh, how humanists can approach and productively use data. So if you encounter in one of these databases um, a scan photograph with very little metadata, um, you know, that's, that's a fragment. And as humanists, we are always dealing with fragmentary sources. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll take what we can get from, from the database um, and in the process of interpreting and analyzing it, um, explain to, to your audience, to your readers, what information you have about a source and, and, uh, and what you don't. And, you know, we, we, we managed to, to do productive work within those limits. I think somebody in the chat has mentioned history pin, which is really great. The it's something we put on our portal as well, and I think it's a really nice way of this kind of community um, commenting on 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 things with with without ownership or little data is kind of community um, approach to creating as much metadata or information on an image or an audio file as as you can get. It's a really really nice example too. The trick to the crowdsourcing of metadata is that you need traffic. And so if, if you have a little website that doesn't have much traffic, you're not going to get any help. Um, but it, yeah, History Pen is great. I'm glad someone brought it up. And um, we, we're sort of basically on, on our time now. But what I might do is just go out with a question because someone mentioned citizen science. So I, I think I might just end with... Um, with sort of a question, because I, I think increasingly, we talk, um, Sean was talking about it's never been easier to do DH. I think it's also never been easier to find the resources you need to do citizen science, although it's it's also extremely, takes a lot of thought and preparation. Um, so as my sort of like closing thoughts, I'd ask maybe what's the contribution uh, of citizen science and participatory involvement in uh, co you know coastal digital history? Um, Anyone, any got any final thoughts on that? Sorry, I was trying to find my mute button. <laughs> um, yeah, I think there, there's a big, uh, big, I think because of the intervention of digital history and the democratization of um, this sort of technology, I think it really helps us to, um, you know, build senses of place and belonging and, um, uh, you know, a feeling of, uh, community and investing in um, shared histories, which I think is is a great impact. And I think once people see themselves as part of a, a, a larger framework and can identify with um, networks of belonging and, um, you know, making sense of the world through these different connections that we can present to them as historians, we're not presenting them with necessarily theories or methodologies we're translating that into digital packages that they then can be a part of and co-produce and take ownership i think that's um, it's got great potential i'll come in to say that that broadly with with citizen science or or uh a participatory work um or with these dh projects more generally um you know these 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 tools are tools, and they should serve our purposes rather than the other way around. Um, so, if you find yourself in a project where uh, it's 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 difficult to fit um, your research aims into the digital tools that you have available, uh, don't feel beholden to them. Um, I think about this a lot with digital mapping. Digital mapping is incredibly powerful, but it's also uh, really complicated and difficult and often frustrating. Um, and I, I come back often to Kevin Lynch's book, The Image of the City, um, and how powerful it is to ask people to draw a map, you know, a pencil and paper, uh, for how they understand the city. And it's not digital, it's not geocoded, it's not something that's geo-referenced to exact space, um, but it's their impression of space um, and and that that can be a, a, a place of starting a, a conversation leading into a digital platform or a digital map. So uh, see these tools as 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 ends uh, or sorry as as means, um, but but not as requirements.
I think something I've always observed is that these problems you always think are going to be technological problems, but they always tend up tend to be more social than than you would expect. And I think that as we've seen from all of our speakers, actually, that when these things become social, that doesn't make them any less complicated, but it, it's it's interesting. It's an interesting spin on, you know, even the most sort of quantitative um, digital humanities. It's always surprisingly, yeah, about people and about relationships and, and in many of our cases, stakeholders. So um, I think I will wrap us up there, but I'd just like to say thanks so much to all of our speakers. I think it was really, really fantastic and a great sort of array of perspectives. Um, before we finish, I'd like to just quickly plug our next seminar, which is happening on the 24th of June on the topic of coastal animals and it will be uh, at 2 p.m uh, british standard time as well and um, i will send a follow-up email with the link to that so that you can sign up um, and i will also as i mentioned uh, be uh, turning this into a podcast and i'll uh, i'll i've start, downloaded the chat so i'll try and find a way of making all these wonderful links available as well so because probably in the um in the show notes for the uh, podcast uh, so that you can access them. Uh, so I'm going to end the recording now and uh, thanks again, everyone, and uh, have a great uh, afternoon.